good morning, Bible class. It's great to see all of you. So if I have not met you yet, my name is Matt Shu. I'm the junior high director here at the church, so I spend a lot of time with 7th and 8th graders. And so I'm super excited to be here. It's a great privilege to open up God's Word with you. And a little bit more about me. I, got, I brought a picture of my family here this morning. This is my family. We'll throw them up on the screen here. Uh, and so that's uh, my wife, Erica. Uh, we've been married since November of 2020. And that's our one-and-a-half-year-old daughter, Haven Grace. And so she is a little tornado and a ball of fun. Uh, and so we're having a whole lot of fun. As a family, we're super blessed uh, to have Haven Grace. And so we've been here for eight years. I've been serving as the junior high uh, director as, for seven years, and I love doing it every single uh, year that goes by. But I invite you to take your Bible and go to the book of Haggai. Uh, and so uh, as we open up to the book of Haggai, I don't know what you talked about at your table. I don't know what you said at your table about what you know about the book of Haggai, but this is one of the most overlooked books of the Bible. And it comes in a collection of books that we call here at Compass HB the 12, because that's what Jesus would have referred to it as, or uh, it's commonly known as the minor prophets. Who's ever heard that term before, the minor prophets, right? And the word minor just means that they're shorter, doesn't mean that they're less significant, and it does not mean that they were written by a minor. That is not what that means. Uh, it just means that they're shorter. Uh, and you can even see in Haggai, I mean, it's 35 verses. And so we're going to go through the entire book because I heard that the Bible class is a place for people that want more Bible. Is that true? So I thought we should try to do the entire book of Haggai all together and see what God says to the people of Israel. And so uh, let's dive into Haggai chapter 1. We'll start in verse 1, and we're going to study it. We're going to read it as we study it all together. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Okay, we're going to stop right there. And I said earlier that Haggai is one of the most commonly overlooked books of the Bible. And the reason for that is because there's a whole bunch of people that call themselves Christians that don't know how to study their Bible. And it's almost like if we had a Bible class at 9 o'clock that had an upcoming series called Have You Not Read? How to Read and Study Your Bible. That would be awesome. That's coming in a couple of weeks. Pastor Bruce did not pay me to say that, I promise. But uh, there's a whole bunch of people that don't know how to study their Bible. And so when they get to a book like Haggai and they read through Haggai 1 and 2, they don't understand it. And one of the reasons they don't understand is because they don't understand what we call the historical context of what's happening in the book of Haggai. Historical context is a very important thing to know when you're opening up God's word. And so if you've ever been confused when you're reading some of the Minor Prophets or the Book of the Twelve or maybe any book of the Bible. I want to give you a, a helpful tip that I do when I'm opening up God's Word and I'm struggling to know uh, when it has been taken place. One thing I do is I just start looking for names or I start looking for events. And so you can see in Haggai chapter 1, verse 1, we see a whole bunch of names all together. We see names like Darius. We see names like Haggai, Zerubbabel, Shealtiel, Joshua, Jehozadak. And you're also going to see in in verse 2, it says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say that the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. And so what I would do is I would either go on my ESV app on my phone or my iPad or my computer, or I would start searching up, okay, where's Darius in the scripture? Where's Haggai at other places in the scripture? Where is Zerubbabel? Are they anywhere else in the Bible to where I can put the book of Haggai in its proper context? Or can I find a time in the Bible where it says that the house of the Lord, the temple, needs to be rebuilt? And if you did that, you would find that a lot of these names in this the rebuilding of the temple happened in the book of Ezra. So I invite you to take your Bible and go to the book of Ezra because I want to show you even just the historical context of what's happening here. So go and take your Bible and go to the book of Ezra. Ezra chapter 2. And a whole bunch happens uh, in between uh, uh, the time where God promised Abraham that there would be a great nation 
and to where we are in the book of Ezra. And so you can notice on your handout, you got one of those handouts here in the Bible class, you're taking proper notes. Uh, so if you've got one of those, there's a big space in between the top and point number one, because we're going to go deep into the book of Ezra here in a minute. But I also have a timeline that I brought, and I want to throw up on the screen. You can draw this, you can call it to memory, you can take a picture of it. But this is basically a, a, a basic overview of what happened uh, over the course of the history of the nation of Israel. And we'll start in 1 Kings chapter 12. In 1 Kings chapter 12, it's a historic moment in, the, in God's people, the people of Israel, because they split into two nations, the nation of Israel and the nation of what? Judah, right? We have the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. And if you read First, first and Second Kings, you are going to see the downward spiral of the nation of Israel and the nation of Judah because there are wicked kings who lead the people into idolatry. And, and, and so we, eventually what ends up happening in 2 Kings chapter 17 is the nation of Israel gets taken captive by Assyria. The northern kingdom gets taken over and brought into exile in 722 BC. And then if you read 2 Kings 25, you're going to read about the nation of Judah being taken into exile uh, in 586 BC. And in 2 Kings 25, it describes what happened when Babylon came in and wiped the nation of Judah out. I have it up on the screen. Uh, 2 Kings 25, verses 9 through 11, it's talking about the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. It says, He burned the house of the Lord and the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem and every great house he burned down and all the army of the Chaldeans who were with the captain of the guard. He broke down the walls around Jerusalem. And so you have utter destruction happening when the king of Babylon comes into town. I mean, all the houses, they're gone. The temple completely wiped out. The walls completely torn down. The king's palace is completely gone. And if you read Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 10, you're going to see that this this exile, this captivity lasted for 70 years. And so if you just do some basic math, you go from 586 minus 70 equals 516, right? And, and that is where we find ourselves in the book of Ezra. The book of Ezra and the book of Haggai are what we call post-exilic books. It happens after the exile, after they get brought back to their land. And so if you're in Ezra, you see this happen in Ezra chapter 2 verse 1. It says, now these were the people of the province who came up out of the captivity of those exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried captive to Babylonia. They returned to Jerusalem to, and Judah, each to his own town. And so they get back into the land, and then Ezra chapter 3, they, they start building an altar to offer sacrifices to God. And you could read in Ezra chapter 3, verse 8, all the way down to verse 13. Let's pick it up there. It says, Now in the second year after their coming to the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month, Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Jehozadak, made a beginning together with the rest of their kinsmen, the priests and the Levites, and all who had come to Jerusalem from the captivity. They appointed the Levites from 20 years old and upward to supervise the work of the house of the Lord. And so they decide, hey, we're going to rebuild the temple. We're going to rebuild God's dwelling place where we go and offer sacrifice and worship to God. We are going to rebuild this massive structure. And so they decide to do that. And you could see in verse 10, the builders, they laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord. The priests in their vestments came forward with trumpets and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with symbols to praise the Lord according to the directions of the king, David, the king of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever towards Israel. And all, all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord, the foundation of the temple was laid. But I want you to look at this in verse 12. It says, but many of the priests and the Levites and the heads of fathers' houses Old men who had seen the first house wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of this house being laid, though many shouted for joy. So you would imagine that if you get brought back into the land of Israel and we decide altogether we are going to rebuild the temple, you would imagine the response would be, wow, this is awesome. This is amazing. This is exactly what we need. Not everybody thought like that. 
The people who saw the first temple, the the temple that was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, they saw that temple and they were starting to compare this temple with the old temple and they were disappointed. It says in verse 13, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. For the people shouted with a great shout and the sound was heard far away. So this reaction of the temple being built, it's mixed because this new temple, it's not comparing like the old one. And in Ezra chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the return to exiles were building a temple to the Lord, the God of Israel, they approached Zerubbabel, who's the governor of Judah, and the heads of the father's houses, and said to them, Let us build with you, for we worship your God as you do. And we have been sacrificing to him ever since the day of Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. And so the people, the adversaries, now you can write it down in your handout, in Ezra 4, verse 1, the adversaries of Judah, it would have been the Samaritans, the Samaritans, and they had been taken over by the Assyrians, like how we learned about in 722 BC. And you might be asking yourself, uh, in verse 3, if you look at the response here, it says, but Zerubbabel, Jeshua, the the rest of the father's houses, the houses in Israel, said to them, you have nothing to do with us in building a house to our God. God, but we alone will build to the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, had commanded us. And so the adversaries in the north, the Samaritans, they say, hey, we want to help you rebuild this temple. We want to help you out. It's a big task. Let's help you. We worship God as you do. And they say, well, you have nothing to do with us in building a temple. In Hebrew, you can really translate it, it is not for you and I. Like, it's not for the both of us to be doing this. And you might be asking yourself, well, why? Wouldn't they want some help in taking part of a big task like this? Well, if you go to 2 Kings 17, you have to turn there, I have it up on the screen. 2 Kings 17, 32, we get a little insight of what the northerners were like. It says, they also feared the Lord and appointed from among themselves all sorts of people as priests of the high places who sacrificed for them in the shrines of the high places so they feared the Lord but also served their own gods after the manner of the nations from among whom they had been carried away. And so when they say, oh, we worship the Lord as you do, no, they don't. They don't worship the Lord as they do because they have a double-minded, a double commitment. They worship God and idols. And when they get back into the land, they just had a whole history of idolatry. Say, we want nothing to do with your worship. And so they reject it. And so then the people in verse 4, the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and made them afraid to build and bribed counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So you have the northerners, they discourage the people of Judah. They say, no, this is not what you should do. And they even bribed the counselors, the wise men. They, they bribed them for their cause to frustrate their purpose, to get them, when they were all excited about rebuilding the temple, well, now the people of Judah, they're frustrated. Well, is this what we should do? And eventually what happens, and you can read it later on if you want, in Ezra chapter 4, verses 7 to 16, the northerners write a letter to King Artaxerxes, and they accuse the people of Judah of sedition. They accuse them of not wanting to pay money or taxes, but they accuse them of uh, rebelling against the king. And so the king, in Ezra chapter 4, verse 17 to 20. Two, if you read verse 24 of Ezra chapter 4, it says, Then the work of the house of God that is in Jerusalem stopped, and it ceased until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So they re- he received this letter. He agreed, yep, these people, they're wicked, they're terrible. And so he decides, nope, you were going to stop building the house of God. Now, if you read Ezra chapter 5, verse 1, look what this says. Now the prophets, what does it say, everybody? Read it. Haggai. Now the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Edo, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. So this is where we find ourselves in Ezra chapter 5. So what's been happening is they have this house of the Lord that has been torn down. They started to build it. They got discouraged. And so now there's this pause period where they're not building the house of God 
And that's where we find ourselves in the book of Haggai. So with all that context, go back to the book of Haggai because that was only the first verse, everybody. So go back to the book of Haggai. You said you wanted more Bible. I asked you. You said you wanted more. Uh, and so go to the book of Haggai. Haggai chapter 1, verse 2. Because as we go through all of that, because if you understand the historical context, when you read through the book of Haggai, it's going to make way more sense to you. Now, Haggai chapter 1, verse 2, here's what God says to the people. He says, thus says the Lord of hosts, the King of all, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. What does he say? Yahweh says, these people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. And the question that we got to ask ourselves is, who is these people? These people are the people of Judah. Oh, it's not time to rebuild the house of the Lord. It's not time to rebuild the temple. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? And now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag of holes. So in this time where the temple is not being built, what are they doing? It says in verse 4 that they are building their own paneled houses while God's house lies in ruins. And so this is really what we're going to talk about. The crux of the book of Haggai is that you and I, we need to get on God's agenda. We need to be desiring our drive, our purpose of our life should be what God wants, not what we want. Because when we live, we live here in the South, uh, we live in Southern California in Orange County. Anybody thankful to live in Orange County, California these days? Like it's a nice place to live, right? I mean, it is beautiful. The rain yesterday, if you're at the bunny run, I mean, that just felt miserable running in the rain. But I mean, that's a rare occasion we get rain around here, right? I mean, we have a special names when we get rain. Like, we call it El Nino, right? Like, we have to have a special name for when it starts to rain. I mean, it's a nice place to live. But, see, if you just drive around Orange County, people have a lot of nice things. And if you talk to people in Orange County, I mean, the, the drive of their life is this life. The things that they could build right now. The things they can get right here, the temporary pleasures and desires and the idols that they can achieve right here on earth. I was just talking to a guy yesterday, and he was talking about his workplace, and the guy sitting right next to him, he's working so hard. I mean, he works like almost 70 hours a week, and he's got post-it notes all over his computer screen with all of his goals of his life. And the goals of his life is get debt-free, pay off that mortgage, and there's a whole bunch of worldly things that he has. And those are the things that are driving him, temporary things. And what God wants us to see through the book of Haggai is that we got to get on God's agenda. And it's going to be difficult. It's going to be hard. But the truth is, what we're going to get to is that God is with us and that one day we are going to dwell with him for all of eternity. So it is going to be worth it. And so go to the book of Haggai. So you look in Haggai 1 verse 4. It says, Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? And so the heart of what's happening is they are not concerned about God's agenda. They're not concerned about what God wants. They're more concerned about their own comfortability. They're more concerned about their own interests. And a lot of Orange County people who call themselves Christians, they would claim to be God's people. They would claim to love him. But if we were honest, they would be more concerned about building their career. They'd be more concerned about buying a house. They'd be more concerned about building a portfolio, building a family, building my life towards retirement. And ultimately, if you get down to the very heart of it, a lot of it is driven by self-aspiration. I, I just want to do my own thing. And they will make sacrifices in their life to achieve things here on earth because that is what is important to them. And we can be so self-centered and we can act like this world is really all about us and the things I get in this life, like that's what's really going to make me happy. People think that if I just live the most fulfilled life here on earth, that's how I'm going to be happy. And that is not the way that God calls the Christians to live. Go to 1 Peter chapter 4. But take your Bible and go to 1 Peter chapter 4. Because I want to show you what God calls us to. 
God saves us out of wrath. God does not give us what we deserve. By his unmerited grace and mercy, we can be forgiven of our sin. But in 1 Peter chapter 4, it's going to tell us what God has called us to. Page 1016, if you've got one of our books. And the, the book of 1 Peter is written during a time where there is massive persecution um, uh, to the Christians. I mean, there's this emperor, his name is Nero, and he's a wicked, wicked man. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live. This one we pay attention to in verse 2. So as to live for the rest of the time. In the flesh, like how are you to live as a Christian while you are in your physical body, while you are in the flesh, while you're still breathing as a human being, how are you supposed to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the what, everybody? Will of God. Not for my will. Not for what I want. But for the will of God. This is what God has saved you to. God didn't just save you to give you fire insurance. God saved you to good works. God saved you to give him glory. And if we act like this life is all about me and the temporary pleasures that I can get, we're missing the point of our salvation. The question I want to ask you is, is God's glory a top priority for you? Is God's agenda a top priority for you? I mean, God has made it very clear what he wants. Like, God, he's not asking for us to build a temple. Like, he's not asking for us to do that. But God has made it very clear what he wants and what he desires. I mean, one thing that we know that God wants is God wants all people to be saved. Is that true? God wants all people to be saved. He wants all people to come to a knowledge of the truth. Our God does not delight in the death of the wicked. He's patient towards people. He's wishing that everyone would reach repentance. Like, is that a top priority for you? Is people in your fellowship group or in your small group then becoming more holy? Is that a priority for you? So point number one, you can write it down like this on your handout. you got to make your agenda God's agenda. you got to make your agenda God's agenda. we got to make sure that our desires are in line with God's desires, that I'm not just living my life for the here and now, but I live for the ultimate glory of God. And you can tell what you really desire, and what you really live for. I mean, just by the things that you talk about, just by the things that you think about. I mean, I do this thing in the junior high ministry. I did it at camp. It was a fun thing that we did. We just came back from this junior high camp. Did you hear about this camp? We talked about the love of God. And we talked about 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 4 and 7, because one thing that junior high students don't do well is love other people. They are, do not do that very well. They are pretty selfish, right? Like we all are. And it's specifically, they don't love their parents like they should. They don't love their brother and siblings like they should. Anybody want to say amen to that? Testify, right? You agree with this? Like, they don't love their siblings or their parents like they should. And so I did this thing at junior high camp. I got on stage. I was, I was preaching through 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 7. We're talking about love being patient and kind and bearing all things and believing all things. And I said, hey, is this your standard of love? Like, it, are you this sort of person? And so I pulled out my phone. And I said, to be honest, guys, I got all your parents' phone numbers. I could just call him right now in the middle of the sermon. I'm like, I could just do this. I could do it. And I start listing off names like, should I call this person? And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that kid's like, no, don't do it. Like, I, I don't want to hear what they have to say about that because my parents would know that I'm not bearing with my siblings. I'm not very patient. And I just insist on my own way. See, if I went to your spouse here in the Bible class, or I went to your kids in the Bible class, what would they say that you prioritize? The things here of this life or God's ultimate agenda? Do they hear you talking more about God's glory than your own life here on earth? Like we're not calling for people to be ignorant of this life. God has given us things in this life to be good stewards of, but the second we start living for those things and make those things idols in our life and striving for those things and acting like those things are going to make me happy, that's when we got to say time out and repent of that real quick. we got to live for the ultimate glory of God. we got to make sure that our desires are in line with God's desires. And this idea 
of having desire. It's been very weakened. Or when we say that I love something, like in our culture, we say that we love a whole bunch of things. Like I say all the time, I love pizza. Right? I say that all the time. Or I love Dr. Pepper. If you get to know me, I love Dr. Pepper. It's like one of my favorite drinks to ever have. Right? And we say that in this idea of love, it just like means, oh, we really like something. Or I desire something. Oh, I just, I don't mind if it doesn't happen. I, of course, I don't not want it to happen. See, when we say that we desire something, See, that's different than how the Bible would describe desire. See, when the Bible talks about desire, when the Bible talks about a will, it's talking about a desire that leads to action, a desire that leads to driven sort of action. Just how God desires to be saved. And does does God withhold his hand from salvation? No, he does not. Just how Jesus, when he was praying in the garden, he said, not my will, but yours be done. And he was obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross, to follow the will of God. You and I, we need to live according to the will of God. Because I don't know many people that would honestly say, yeah, I want that person to go to hell. I want that person to not have forgiveness. I don't know many people that say things like that. But the truth is, there's a whole bunch of people that are so caught up in temporary pleasure Hey, don't go and preach the gospel. This is what God has called us to as Christians. God has called you as a Christian to preach the good news of Jesus Christ. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Ready to take your Bible and go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I have a fear that we maybe don't understand the importance of this as Christians. This is our responsibility. This is what God has given to us. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16. 2 Corinthians 5, 16, it says, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Has anybody experienced that? Well, the old you has passed away and the new has come. Like you are not who you used to be. Praise the Lord for that. It says in verse 18, all this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and, here's the key word, entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And see, this is one thing I talk about with so many people who call themselves Christians, especially at our church, is what it says here in 2 Corinthians 5, 19, that God has entrusted to you the ministry of reconciliation. Do you know what it means to entrust something to someone? Because I've been entrusted with some things in my life. Like, I'll give you an example. When I was in high school, I had a cat. Anybody have cats in here? You have a cat? I had a cat. And I, this cat was a rare breed of cat. Not like it was some like weird, like weird breed of cat. Like it was a strange cat, in fact, because no, most cats just hate people. You know, most cats, they, like they're just not people. People, you know, not people. You know, they 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 don't like people that much. And so we had a cat, and this cat was just a super cuddly cat all the time. And so uh, we also had a family friend who also had a cat. The cat's name was Tommy. And so what would happen is we would often go on vacation and our family friend would watch our cat. And then when, they're, uh, when they went on vacation, we would watch their cat, Tommy. And when I was in high school, uh, the, this family friend of ours went out of town. And I had to watch Tommy. My dad was also out of town. I had to watch Tommy. And I got to be honest, I did a killer job at watching Tommy. Like I was a good pet owner for a good two weeks, right? And I fed this thing. I gave him water. I scooped his litter box. I did everything a good cat owner would do. And I remember getting a phone call. Like we, we, I returned Tommy. I got a phone call the next day. I said, Tommy died. It was from my dad. Tommy died. I was like, what? What did you say? Yeah, Tommy died. And I was like, from what? My dad was like, dehydration. And I was like, what? What do you mean? My dad's like, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, he died of natural causes, you know? But it caused, it caused me to think for a second, you know? Like, man, I had this responsibility. This lady trusted me with her cat. Did I just murder a cat? Like, I, I genuinely was concerned. 
It wasn't me. I, prom- I promise you it was not me. It's been proven, okay? Don't call me a cat murderer. Didn't do it. I, I'm innocent. Don't sue me, okay? I, I, I'm innocent. So point is, I was entrusted to take care of this cat. And when, I, when, I, when the moment came where I thought to myself, wait, did I not do what I was supposed to do? It caused me to really think and look back and think, man, did I do everything right? No, I'm pretty sure I gave this cat a whole bunch of water. Like, I'm pretty sure it was pretty well fed the whole time. I took very good care of this cat. And see, the truth is, is what's going to happen to a whole bunch of people who call themselves Christians, that God has entrusted to you the ministry of reconciliation, like it's your job to preach the gospel. And then when people stand before Christ, they're going to have to give an account for every word that they have done. And they haven't preached the gospel to anybody. They kind of just live for the here. And now in 1 Corinthians 13, or 1 Corinthians 3 says that people are going to look back and live in regret because they didn't really go after the gospel because they didn't go after the things that are imperishable. They went for the things that are perishable. See, do you desire what God desires, and do you live that out day after day? Now go back to Haggai chapter 1. Go back to Haggai chapter 1, because you can see here, God continues in verse 6. Haggai 1, 6, he says this. He says, to consider your ways. And we, we understand this sort of concept. Like if you have kids, one thing that you're going to know is your kids don't often say the right thing. They say things that could be rude. They say things that could be harsh. And so what you would say to them is you should sit and you should think about what you said. Has anybody ever said that to their kids? Like you need to sit and think about what you said. And the point would be not for them to think about the profound wisdom that just came out of their mouth, but for the wickedness and the foolishness that came out of their mouth. Like, hey, you said something wrong. You said something that you should not have said. Think about that. And don't do it again. That's what God is doing here in verse 5. It says, now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Like, think about all this time you spent building up your house. Consider your ways. Look at, look at this. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You clothe yourselves, or you drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. God, if you keep reading here in verses 7 through 11, God is going to say why this is happening, why they are sowing a lot of seed in the field and not getting a lot of crop. In verse 7, it says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways, go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why? declares the Lord of hosts. Because my house that lies in ruins, while each of you busies himself with his own house. Therefore, the heavens above you have withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the land, on the hills, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, on what the ground brings forth, on man and beast, and on all their labors. Like God is directly intervening on all their labor, on all their hard work. Like they're sowing a lot of seed, not a lot of crops coming up. And they're, they're searching for a lot of new wine. They're not getting it. There's not a lot of dew coming down to water all of the crops. God is getting directly involved. He promises. He could write it down in your hand in Deuteronomy chapter 28. Like if you don't live for me, or you write down Leviticus 26, there are blessings for obedience and there are curses for disobedience. Like if you don't live right, you don't obey, your life's not going to go great. And God actually says, I'm going to withhold the produce. That's what's happening here. Like they're not living right. And so God, being a just God, is judging them. They're not getting what they want. And God is not maybe physically intervening and and not giving us what we want, but in a very spiritual way, there's a whole bunch of people that look for the things of the earth, and they look for them to make them happy and for satisfaction. And then when they really get them, it doesn't turn out to make them as happy as they thought it would. And it leaves them empty and it leaves them broken. It's because you're not made to worship anything else or anyone else but him. And so go, keep going to Haggai chapter 1, verse 12. Haggai 1, 12 to 15. The people, they obey. The people, they repent. They, they turn. It says in verse 12, Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, 
the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message, I am with you, declares the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, by the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and with the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the month, in the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king. And so they obey. They say here in verse 12, that they start fearing God. They're not fearing the adversaries anymore, the people that are telling them, hey, you shouldn't be building the temple. Remember those northerners, how they're saying, no, you you can't go building this. It's not going to go well for you. Now they're not fearing the adversaries. Now they're fearing God. And so then we get to Haggai chapter 2. And you go read in Haggai 2, 1, in the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month. And so if you go back to the timestamp in Haggai 1, 1, this is the one-month progress report. How are we doing? How are we doing in building the temple? Okay, we're, we're laying the foundation. We're doing good. Uh, here's the one-month progress report, and here's what God says in verse 2. It says, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to all the remnant of the people, and say, Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, a high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts, according to the covenant of the, that I made with you when you came out of Egypt. My spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. So what God says is, how is it going? he says here, well, who's left among you saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? Like, you're building this new temple. And if you remember from Ezra chapter 4, like, were they pumped, uh, the older people of the land, were they pumped up about this new temple, or were they a little discouraged how lame the new temple was? A little discouraged. Uh, It's not like it used to be. And so what God says, is it not as nothing in your eyes? Like, does it not really mean anything to you? And see, this is the truth of being a follower of God, because you might go out, and you might go preach the gospel to someone. And if you've ever preached the gospel to anybody, one thing that you're going to know, not everybody you preach the gospel to goes, you know what? You are so right, you fountain of wisdom. You are just so right. I'm a wretched sinner in need of saving. I need grace. I need to repent. Not everybody says that. No, when you start preaching the gospel, people actually may start rejecting you. Or maybe they don't even care. They're kind of just in this complacent spot. They don't really care. They don't really mind. So what happens to a lot of people who call themselves Christians is they get very discouraged. It's like, I'm preaching the gospel. I'm doing everything God would want me to do. I'm praying about it. I'm praying for open doors. And when those open doors come, I'm having them. But see, what God wants us to see is that what you need to do is to be faithful to what God says. The results are up to God. It's not up to you to save someone. It's not up to you to build God's kingdom. Jesus builds his church. It's not up to us. And so if people aren't responding the way that the Bible calls them to, we can't take that as God leaving us, as God not being with us. Because when you really preach the gospel, I mean, it says in Isaiah chapter 65 that the word, when the word of God rings forth, it accomplishes what its purpose is. Like when you preach the gospel to someone, like it may seem that it falls on deaf ears, But see, the word of God always accomplishes its purpose. And so you and I, when people do not respond like the way that we thought they would, we cannot be discouraged. In fact, look what God tells for them to do. He says it over and over again. And when the Bible repeats something over and over again, it's trying to draw an emphasis. It's trying to draw a point. It's trying to make something clear. It has no capital letters or emojis or exclamation points. How the Bible often emphasizes is through repetition. And so one thing that you're going to see in Haggai 2, what he says to the people is these two words, be strong, O Zerubbabel. Be strong, O Joshua, the high priest. Be strong, 
all you people of the land. And the other thing that he keeps saying over and over, if you look back at Haggai 1, verse 13, he says, I am with you, declares the Lord. Or if you read Haggai 2, verse 4, he says, work for I am with you. Why can the people of Judah be encouraged to keep going, to be strong, even though it's not really going the way that they thought it was going to go? It's because God is with them. And they can be strong because of that. Point number two, you can write this down in your handout. You gotta be strong knowing God is with you. You gotta be strong knowing God is with you. Why can you work? Why can you labor for the gospel? How can you be strong? Well, it's not your strength, it's the strength that God supplies. The fact that God is with you. Because I know a whole lot, I know a whole lot of people who get very discouraged. When they start preaching the true and right gospel to people and people aren't responding, it's almost like they act like God is checked out of their conversation. It's almost like, oh, well, I don't know. Maybe God will intervene next time. Time out. It's not the way that God works. No, it doesn't mean if you're preaching the gospel and people aren't responding, you need to know God is with you. And not only that, look what this says here in, in verse 5. I mean, to the people of Israel, it says, According to the covenant I made with you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst. Like, it's around you. But see, to the New Testament Christian, I mean, if you go to Acts chapter 2, where does the spirit dwell? Where does it dwell, dwell today? In me. In us. See, not only is the spirit in their midst, but for the New Testament Christian, the spirit is in us. And he never leaves you. And he never forsakes you. This is the promise that we got to hold on to. This is the promise that Jesus gave his disciples when he went out and sent them out. Go to Matthew chapter 28. Everybody take your Bible and go to Matthew chapter 28. This is the promise that Jesus gave to his disciples right before he ascended into heaven. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. Matthew 28, verse 18. Who's ever heard these verses before? You ever heard these verses before? foundational verses for the church, our mission. Matthew 28, 18, Jesus came and said to them, the disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, marvel at this, I am with you always to the end of the age. The reason you can go out in confidence, the reason you can go out and be strong at your workplaces, at your schools, is because God is with you. And he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So you can be strong. You don't have to fear. Because he is with you. Now go back to Haggai chapter 2. We'll keep going here. Haggai chapter 2, verse 6. Haggai 2 Verse 6, he says, For thus says the Lord of hosts, Yet once more in a little while I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, so that the treasures of all nations shall come in, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts, and in this place I will give peace declares the Lord of hosts. And so you have all these people who are discouraged at this new temple. Oh, well, it's not like the old one. It's not like how it used to be. But what God says is, in a little while, I'm going to shake the nations. In a little while, I'm going to come and I'm going to fill this house, this temple with glory. The silver is going to be mine. The gold is going to be mine. In the latter glory of this house, the glory that's going to fill this temple, it is going to be greater than the former temple. The former temple that you thought was so awesome and so great. No, this latter one, it's going to be even better. It's going to be full of glory. It says, in this place, I will give peace, declares the Lord of Host. So we got to take a time out for a moment. So we got to think, okay, well, they're rebuilding the temple. And if you read Ezra chapter 4, and you read all through the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, does the temple eventually get built? Yes, it does. It gets built. But see, if you read through Ezra and Nehemiah, does the glory of God ever descend on the temple again like it did in the tabernacle? It does not. So it's not full of glory like it used to be. So what does this mean? 
that's going to be full of glory, this house that's going to be full of glory. And when he says this house, like he's meaning this house, like this, this temple that you are building, it's going to be full of glory. So what does that mean? So if you go through the history of Israel, like this temple, it survives. It survives through 586 all the way to 70 AD. That's where it exists until. So let me ask you a question. Who lived, which is one person, just name one person who lived in between a 580, 516 and 780. Who's one person that lived in that time, everybody? Jesus, Jesus Christ. So he says, I'm going to fill this house with glory. This is what we call like a dual fulfillment prophecy. Because in a sense, when Jesus, it says in John chapter, why don't we just go to John chapter 1 really quick. Go to John chapter 1. I want to show you what this says about Jesus coming down to earth. Because the temple, what it really is, it's God's dwelling with man. That is what the temple is. And in John chapter 1, verse 14, John 1, verse 14, well, let's start in verse 1. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him. And without Him was not made anything that was made. In Him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Well, who is this word? Who is this logos? Verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as the only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Who is this talking about, everybody? Jesus. The word. He's with God. He is God. He was with God. He's in the beginning with God, and he came flesh and dwelt among us. Now the word dwelt among us, it's this, we, it's this Greek word skanao. And the Greek word skanao really means he tabernacled among us. He dwelt among us. And Jesus, when he's about to die, what does he say about his body? He says that they will destroy what everybody? This temple. In the three days, I will build it up again. So when it says that I'm going to fill this house with glory, it's partially fulfilled when Jesus tabernacles among us, when he dwells among us here on earth. But see, it's going to come to its fulfillment, its final fulfillment on the day when God dwells with his people. Go to Revelation chapter 21. Everybody take your Bible and go to Revelation chapter 21 because you know that this temple in 70 AD got destroyed by the Romans. So this temple, even go to Jerusalem today, I mean, it's not the same temple that they built in 516. It's not the same one. It got destroyed. And so when God says that he's going to fill it with glory, and in verse 9, he says that he's going to give this place some peace. I mean, if you go to Israel today, the temple's not really known for being a peaceful place. I mean, it's, it, there's a whole bunch of conflict. There's tension around the temple these days. But this comes to its final fulfillment here in Revelation 21, verse 1. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. Talking about our future, our, our holy city. I saw a holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard with a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the skenao, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. So what would encourage them to keep on going, to be strong, knowing that God is with them? But what would encourage them to keep on going? That the house is going to be full of glory, that God is going to dwell with his people again. So you had point number two on your handout, and point two was be strong knowing that God is with you. Let's add the point number two, because not only being strong knowing that God is with you, but you can also be strong knowing God is with you and that you will be with him. That's how you can be strong today, to go and preach the good news, knowing that you will be with him. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he talks about, he gives this illustration of a runner. Who ran the bunny run yesterday? You run the bunny run? I'm sorry. I feel bad. I, feel, I was watching on the sidelines. Like I chose wisdom, and I said, I'm not going to run 3.2 miles in the rain. And so I chose wisdom. And, but if you ran, I'm sorry. Uh, but you know that that race has a finish line. And if you, if you were standing where I was standing, I mean, you saw some people. When they saw the finish line, they were booking it to the finish line. Their legs feeling like jello. People are collapsing after they get down the finish line. They just can't handle being across the finish line, right? But I mean, the Bible uses the illustration of a race and a finish line as a, an example to the Christian, like, hey, there is a finish line. 
There is a day when the work and the running is going to stop. And what we need to do is keep our eyes on the finish line. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, Paul says, Do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Verse 26, he doesn't run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others I myself should be disqualified. Like what he really goes for is a imperishable wreath. What he goes for is being across the finish line in glory. I mean, I want you to imagine like yesterday, if we said, hey, you know, we're all going to line up at the bunny run and we're going to blindfold everybody. And we know we said it was a 5k, which I just found out yesterday. 5k means five kilometers. My mind was blown because anytime someone says 5k, you think 3.2 miles, right? That's just me being young and naive, right? 5K, five kilometers, anyway. Um, but I say, instead of it being 5Ks or 3.2 miles, we're not gonna tell you where the finish line is. And you can be blindfolded. It could be 30 feet in front of you. could be 70,000 feet away. But you're blindfolded. You don't know what it is. But see, what if you, you're like, okay, you know, I don't know. Is the finish line really near? Is it really close? And you just started walking. You start strolling. And then 15 feet in front of you, you realize, wait, I'm done. Across the finish line. You would think, man, I, that was it? I wish I would have ran harder. The finish line is coming. You don't know when the finish line is. No one knows when the hour is coming. No one knows when Jesus returns. You got to run and be strong like, it could be today. Like, if today was your last day, who would you preach the gospel to? Because it could be today. This could be the last Bible class ever. This whole Bible class that Pastor Bruce is planning, he could not even teach it. It could be done. This could be our last service of church today. Because Jesus could come back. we got to live with the end in mind. The question I want to ask you is, are you letting up? Are you giving up? Are you acting well? Is the finish line really near? Friends, it could come sooner than you know. And while we are here, the good news is we can be strong. And why can we be strong? Colossians 1.29, we can throw it up on the screen. Colossians 1.29, that's what Paul says. I mean, Paul, he was a guy that struggled. He was a guy who worked hard in the gospel. And how can he toil? How can he strive? How can he work hard for the gospel? It says, this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. That the same power that rose Jesus from the grave is the same power dwelling inside me and you today. You could run hard, and it's going to be tiring. It's going to be exhausting, but God will give you the strength to keep on going. Now, go back to Haggai chapter 2. Let's finish up here in Haggai chapter 2. Haggai chapter 2. You guys still with me? You guys still with me here in the Bible class? Okay, Haggai chapter 2. Haggai 2, verse 10. Haggai 2, 10. It says, on the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet. Thus says the Lord of hosts. So here we are again, a couple months later, right? It says this. It says, thus says the Lord of hosts, ask the priests about the law. Hey, take the guys who know a lot about the law of Moses and bring them here. And he says, if someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment, and touches with his fold bread or stew or wine or oil or any kind of food, does it become holy? And the priest answered, no, it does not become holy. And Haggai said, if someone who is unclean by contact with a dead body touches any of these, does it become unclean? And the priest answered and said, it does become unclean. So time out. Like, what is he talking about? Holy meat in garments in folds. What are we talking about? You'd have to go back to the law. Who just read the law with us as a church, right? So if you read the law, I mean, you're going to know that there is a distinction between things that are clean and things that are unclean. And if you were clean, that was right. That was right before God. If you were unclean, that was you were not right before God. And so he's using this illustration here in Haggai. And so if you just go to Haggai chapter 2, verse 11, or verse 12, he says, if someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment. Okay, so just imagine this, right? A common way we can think about it is like if I carried holy meat in my shirt pocket right here, right? If I carried holy meat, a little gross, but if I carried it in my shirt pocket right here, in my shirt pocket, 
touch something else. Like if holy meat, like oh, holy meat can touch something and make it holy. That's what the law says. But if I, it touches the shirt pocket and then the shirt pocket touches something, like is it third degree sort of holiness that we have? Like do we have sort of just holiness due to association? And the pre answers, no, that doesn't work like that. Now he says this in verse 13, then Haggai said, if someone who is unclean by contact with a dead body touches any of these, does it become unclean? And the priest answered and says, it does become unclean. You know, if you read the law, if you touch something that's unclean, you become unclean. It doesn't work the other way around. Verse 14, then Haggai answered and said, so it is with this people and with this nation before me, declares the Lord. And so with every work of their hands and what they offer there, is unclean, like they still got sin. They're still unclean. They're still not right. And what they offer is unclean. Now then consider from this day onward, before the stone was placed upon stone in the temple of the Lord, how did you fare? When one came to heap of 20 measures, there were but 10. When one came to the wine vat to draw 50 measures, there were but 20. I struck you with all the products of your toil and blight and with mildew and with hail, yet you did not turn to me, declares the Lord. Consider this day onward from the 24th day of the ninth month since the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. Consider, is the seed yet in the barn? Indeed, the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have yielded nothing, but from this day on, I will bless you. I mean, who's ever heard the the verse, like, all our good deeds are like filthy rags to him? Who's ever heard a verse like that before? Like, we don't offer righteous things to God on our own. Like, all our good deeds are filthy rags. I mean, that's essentially what he's saying here. It's like you're in disobedience, and you're in sin, and you're trying to offer sacrifices to God. Well, those sacrifices are unclean because you are unclean. But what happens here in verse uh, verse 7, or in verse 5, 15, he says, consider from this day onward before stone was placed upon stone in the temple of the Lord. Like there's this moment where the people of Israel really start obeying. They really start doing what God wants them to do. And he says in verse 18, consider from this day onward, from the 24th day of the month, since the day of the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider, is the seed yet in the barn? Indeed, the vine, the fig, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have yielded nothing. Like when you were kind of just living for your own self over here, when you're kind of just living in your own pleasures and going after your own comfortability of your life, remember how you went after all those things and it yielded nothing? Like it wasn't really like how you wanted it to? But from this day on, from the moment that you start obeying, I will bless you. Point number three, you can write this down in your hand. That you got to see the blessings of faithful obedience. You need to see the blessings of faithful obedience. Like, how are you really going to keep living for the glory of God? Well, first off, we got to get off our own agenda. we got to start living like life's not all about me. Life's about giving glory to God. Because one day, every knee is going to bow to him. And every tongue's going to confess that he is Lord and give him glory i got to serve with strength that God supplies, but I also need to see the blessings of faithful obedience. People don't like this word obedience. They don't like this word. They think obedience is a bad word. Like, oh, no, I have to obey someone. Like, someone has to be my master. I don't just get to do whatever I want. People don't like obedience. People in America like their freedom. Anybody thankful for freedom in America? Like, I, can, I have the freedom. Like, you're in this space. Like, anybody thankful you can worship in this space and you have no fear of authority coming and arresting you right now? Anybody thankful for that? I'm thankful we could open God's word openly right now. So we have this idea of freedom in America, but we, we could take this idea of freedom and we could push it way too far. Because this idea of freedom, like when we think about freedom, it's I just get to do whatever I want. I get to do whatever I want. I get to say whatever I want. And there's no ramifications for that. Obedience, no, I'm my own person. I get to do what I want. I'm accountable to no one. See, this is our idea about freedom in America. But see, we, we need to see that freedom in the Bible backwards. Freedom does not mean I just get to do whatever I want. Freedom is freedom from my slavery of sin. Freedom is now I'm free to obey Christ like the way that God would want me to. People don't like this word obedience. Obedience is a good thing. Amen? Obedience is a great thing. It's a good thing to obey. And God blesses obedience. Are you more full than you've ever been in your soul? The moment you started obeying God and you weren't living for the pleasures of this life, are you more full than you've ever been? Yes, you are. When you share the gospel with someone, and I don't know if you've ever been in a conversation with someone where you preach the gospel to them and they got saved. Has anybody been involved in one of those conversations? I mean, how overjoyed were you when that happened? It was awesome. Like, this is what life is all about. 
It's not about me. It's about giving glory to God. You're happier. You live a blessed sort of lifestyle. See, obedience, there is blessing in obedience. Obedience is not a bad thing. And the moment you start submitting yourself to God, God is going to bless obedience. Go to 2 Peter chapter 1. Everybody take your Bible and go to 2 Peter chapter 1. Look what this says to the believers here in 2 Peter chapter 1. How has God blessed us? 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, page 1018. If you got one of our books in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, it says, His divine power has granted to us, it is gifted to us, it is a blessing, it has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. In Christ, you have everything you need for life and godliness. Is that amazing, anybody? Is that amazing that God would give you everything that you need? And this is in verse 4, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the world because of sinful desire. Now in Christ, you are partakers of his promises. His promises now apply to you. And you find rest in him. I'll go back to Haggai chapter 2. Let's close this up. We're running out of time here. I want to give some time to answer some questions if you have questions. Um, Haggai chapter 2. Let's just go back because there's this, uh, th- there's th- this statement here at the end of Haggai 2 in verse 20. Haggai 2.20, it says, The word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai on the 24th day of the month. Speak to Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, saying, I'm about to shake the heavens and the earth. So this is very similar to the language in Haggai 2 before, that he's going to shake the nations. He's going to overthrow. Verse 22, I'm going to overthrow the the throne of kingdoms, and I'm about to destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the nations and overthrow the nations and their riders and the horses and their riders shall go down, every one by the sword of his brother on that day declares the Lord of hosts. I will take you, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, declares the Lord, and I will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. He's saying there is coming a day. I'm going to shake the nations. I'm going to overthrow kingdoms. I'm going to overthrow thrones. And he says, on that day, I'm going to take you, Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, and I'm going to make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. And we don't have time to turn there. But I encourage you to go to, or to write down Jeremiah chapter 24. Jeremiah chapter 24. Because Zerubbabel, if you go down the line, if you go to Matthew chapter 1, Zerubbabel is in the line of David. God made a promise to David. He made the promise to David that your throne, your kingdom is going to be established forever. And who is that promise really about? It's about Jesus and how he's going to reign on the throne forever. But in Jeremiah chapter 24, one of the people in the line of David, Jehoiachin, One of the last kings says that he gets the signet ring ripped off. It's done. And there's this pause in the the David kingly line. And what this is promising here in Haggai chapter 2 is Zerubbabel putting on that ring again. The signet ring is a symbol of authority. It's a symbol. If you were a king, you would have a signet ring. You would wear it on your pinky finger. It's kind of like in sports how we give champions rings. You guys aware of this thing that happens? Right, they get rings when they win championships. Like they are on top. They've got power. They've got authority. They were the champion. They defeated everybody because they were the best. See, it's the same idea that it's a symbol of a king or someone who has authority and saying that the, the ring, it's going right back on Zerubbabel. And if you go to Matthew chapter 1, everybody take your Bible really quick and go to Matthew chapter 1. I want to show you that this guy Zerubbabel is a big deal. Matthew chapter 1, verse 12. Matthew 1, verse 12. It's the genealogy of Jesus, Jesus' ancestry, his family line. And in Matthew chapter 1, verse 12, it says, And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel. And Shealtiel, the father of who, everybody? Zerubbabel. And it goes all the way down to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So what you have in the book of Haggai is a prophecy about how one day Jesus is going to reign. One day he is going to be on the throne. And this is one of the blessings of faithful obedience is that you get to live in Jesus' kingdom. You get to live with him for all of eternity. And those who endure to the end, they will be what, everybody? Saved. And you'll be secure forever. This is what it means to be on God's agenda. We gotta get off our own agenda. We gotta get on God's agenda. 
We've got to live with the strength that he supplies, and we've got to see the blessings of faithful obedience. So who learned something about the book of Haggai here today? Anybody learned something about the book of Haggai? That's awesome. That's great. I'm glad this wasn't a waste of time. Now, um, are, are there any questions before I pray? We are running out of time, and so I'll take a couple of questions. If you have a question, I would love to answer your questions afterwards, but are there any questions about the book of Haggai? I just explained everything perfectly. I, is, that, is that is what it is? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Hey, hey, what's that? What do you what do you mean by that? Yep. Well, yeah, because I mean, if this is the the second one, and then seventy. A.D., it got destroyed, so Herod had to rebuild it. So technically, this is the third iteration of temple. Any other questions? Yeah? In order for Jesus to be King David, neither was adopted by Joseph, correct? As, uh, as we are adopted in Correct. Yeah, I mean, what we know is that Zerubbabel, if you go through, I mean, he is in the line of David, right? And so this is God's sovereign plan to bring King Jesus through the Davidic. Davidic. No. All right. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Oh, yeah. Question. Amen. Amen. All right, well, let's pray, everybody, and I'll close our time in Bible class. Father, we come to you, and we thank you. God, for these souls who are here, we thank you for their hunger for the word. And Father, I pray that there would be, it's sad that there are right now books of the Bible that your people have never read. You have given your word to us. You've preserved it for thousands of years, and we have never opened our eyes to, to behold of its mystery and its wonder. And so, Father, I, I just come and I ask, God, that we would really take to heart what we hear in the book of Haggai. God, if we've got things in our life that we are living for that isn't your glory, that isn't your agenda, God, that we would repent of that. We would consider our ways that the things that I'm living for, they're not going to fill me up. They're not going to satisfy me. But what life is really all about is giving you glory and the ultimate glory of your son, Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that this would not just go one ear and out the other, but God, that your word would transform us. It would shape us to be more like your son, Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we thank you for this time we got to spend together in your word. And we pray that this week, as we remember the death and resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ, God, that we would marvel at you and that you would show us your glory. We pray in your son's name. Amen.